Newt Gingrich is still flip-flopping on Libya. Oh, come on, man, you gotta give it up. Last night on Fox News, he ripped into the no-fly zone strategy. If they're serious about protecting civilians, you can't do that from the air. This is a fundamental mistake, and I think as a typical politician's over-reliance on air power. So last night, air power alone wasn't enough for Newt. But are you going to be surprised to find out that he sang a different tune two weeks ago on the very same Fox News show? We don't have to send troops. All we have to do is suppress his air force. Oh, come on! Are you for the no-fly zone or aren't you? This is about the fifth flip-flop on the same exact issue. And what does Newt think of flip-floppers? Well, this is what he said in 2004 when talking about John Kerry. Quote, you can't flip-flop and be commander-in-chief. Exactly. Well said, Mr. Gingrich. But he isn't alone. The chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Elena ross Leighton, is right there with him. In late February, she released this statement about Gaddafi. Quote, Stronger penalties must be imposed in order to hold the regime accountable for its heinous crimes. Additional U.S. and international measures should include the establishment and enforcement of a no-fly zone. But then the very day that the no-fly zone was enforced, she told a local TV station, quote, the case has not been made for me to be satisfied that this is the right move for the United States at this time. Now, I would say that that's unbelievable, but that kind of hypocrisy has unfortunately already become normal operating procedure for Republicans. But perhaps the most ridiculous flip-flop comes from good old Oliver North. Here it is. Quite frankly, it's unparalleled. In my entire experience in the military, going all the way back to the 1960s, every president has gone to the Congress to get a resolution to support whatever it is he wanted to do. So now, all of a sudden, Oliver North thinks we should get congressional approval? Congressional approval! Oliver North! I will tell you right now, Council, and all the members here gathered, that I misled the Congress. I missed at that meeting. At that meeting. Face to face. Face to face. You made false statements to them about your activities in support of the Contras. I did. Oops. <laughs> North, of course, is infamous for not getting the approval of Congress as he sold weapons to Iran for the benefit of the Contras. He was indicted on 16 felony counts for not getting congressional approval and for lying to Congress. Man, you gotta give it to them, man. They got chutzpah to put North up there to say you gotta get congressional approval. So obviously the Republicans are politi paying, playing political games here. We've seen it before. Now that's a shame because if we give the president more than a week to make his strategy work in Libya, it may just be the approach to humanitarian intervention that we've been trying to get right for years. Now, I asked Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof that very question last night when we spoke while he was in Cairo. Isn't this what we've been waiting for for decades? Global action taking uh, to head off massacres by dictators? Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, the, maybe the oldest problem in international relations is what you do when you have a dictator devouring his own people. And normally the answer is you, you know, kind of wring your hands and then after it's over, you hold memorial services and solemnly say, I, you know, if only we had known. This time, we're actually doing something and we're doing it pretty speedily. It took three and a half years uh, after Bosnia began before the US and the international community really reacted. This time it took about three and a half weeks, so there is real progress. And what are people on the ground saying, uh, the average Libyan, if you will, are they happy with the military intervention? There's no doubt that people in eastern Libya are overwhelmingly happy with intervention. Now, it is true that people in eastern Libya have always been more antagonistic uh, to Gaddafi. And in western Libya, it's a little harder to gauge because that area is under uh, Gaddafi's control and people obviously don't speak freely. But as far as one can make out, uh, you know, when one does speak, uh, when, when people do talk to people in, in Tripoli or in uh, places around it, uh, then there does seem to be a uh, you know a real antipathy for him as well, although perhaps not as much as there in the e as there is in the east. And there's always ways of telling too, like for example the refugee movement. Can you tell us about that? Are people going in or out of the country? And what what do you think that indicates? 
Yeah, well, uh, I mean, that's fascinating because obviously there is a lot of concern about uh, whether the uh, strikes, uh, the airstrikes, are going to lead to civilian casualties. But right before those airstrikes began, you had Libyans pouring out of Libya into Egypt at about eight times the normal rate. And then once those airstrikes began, the exodus stopped and in fact was reversed. And now Libyans are returning to Libya, going back over toward the airstrikes, which suggests to me that their real concern isn't uh, you know allied airstrikes it's rather Qaddafi himself right so it's is it fair to say at this point that at least as far as stopping the massacres it, it, you know I know there's many objectives but that's certainly one of them that that has worked for the moment being Yes, it absolutely has. It certainly worked in Benghazi. Uh, if we had not intervened, Benghazi streets would be drenched with blood right now. Uh, and in Misrata, it was a harder case because uh, Gaddafi was already right inside uh, Misrata. But now uh, he has pulled back. Apparently today there were only two injuries after days in which there were many, many people killed. Um, so the momentum seems to have shifted. Um, and these kind of mass, massive massacres that would have happened otherwise uh, just are not happening and it's hard to get attention to a massacre that doesn't happen you can't cover a massacre that doesn't happen but that is in fact what the alternative reality would have been had we not intervened and how is this different in Iraq which you opposed I opposed Iraq because in you know when you talk to Iraqis, then it was clear that on the one hand, they uh, distrusted Saddam, they disliked Saddam. On the other hand, they also distrusted the US, uh, disliked the idea of US troops on their territory, and they thought this was all a big con to steal Iraqi oil. On the other hand, you know, you talk to Libyans and they desperately want uh, US involvement, maybe not troops on the ground, and you know, I, I don't think we should send troops on the ground and, and many Libyans would not want that either. But the kind of intervention that has happened so far uh, in terms of a no flight zone, a no drive zone, uh, airstrikes, that is something that seems to have overwhelming support uh, from Libyans themselves. And that's a huge difference from Iraq. Now, you know, I've been talking about this uh, throughout the show. It seems that people cannot get it through their thick heads that maybe the extreme answer isn't the right answer in every case, whether we either do absolutely nothing or we send in every troop we've got in a ground invasion. That perhaps the best answer in a case like this is to do air cover and see if uh, Qaddafi gets toppled. But I want to ask you an interesting question. If Qaddafi doesn't get toppled, is it still a bit of a victory because we've stopped the massacres? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, if you, uh, it would be nice to, to liberate people in Tripoli from Qaddafi. But if you happen to live in Benghazi and you are alive today and your children are alive today because of that no-flight zone, well, you know, that sure feels like a victory to you. And throughout the history of the last hundred years or so, the biggest problem in averting humanitarian disasters is that there are no ideal solutions. Nothing works perfectly. And as a result, the temptation always is to do nothing. Well, you know, this time we're doing something. It's not ideal. There are a million uncertainties. But one of the certainties is that there are a lot of people in Benghazi who are alive today who wouldn't be otherwise. It seems to me that people are being wildly unfair to the president. I mean, we we haven't had a, even a week of this so far, and it seems like it's already accomplished one of its major goals, and somehow this is being chalked up as, you know, bad idea just because it's a solution that's in the middle. Now, that's my thought on it. Do you think that uh, this strategy might actually work? Are the critics here at home being unfair to this approach? Well, I mean, on the one hand, I think a lot of the criticisms have some real validity to it. There are uncertainties. But, you know, on the other hand, you have to weigh that against a lot of people who are alive today who wouldn't be otherwise. And the other criticism that is made, which also has some validity, is that we're inconsistent, that we intervene in Libya and we don't in Ivory Coast. And, you know, that's true, too. But I would rather inconsistently save some lives than consistently save none.